coast to coast. The Stephen A. Smith Show starts right now. Welcome to our number two. Smith Show. What's Coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airways of ESPN What's Radio and ESPN News. Number to call up is always 888-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That's ESPN Radio. 250 plus markets across the United States of America. ESPN Radio and Sirius XM Channel 80 plus ESPN Radio Summercast over the live national television airwaves of ESPN News. A reminder that Golick and Wingo will be live from New York this Friday covering the Jets-Patriots matchup. Part of ESPN Radio's Fall Football Tour, brought to you by Marathon. Get five cents off every gallon every day with Make It Count rewards from Marathon. To sign up, visit makeitcount.com or download the free app. Stephen A. Smith Show is also being brought to you by New Shell V-Power Nitro plus premium gasoline. Now with four levels of defense against gunk, wear, corrosion, and friction. Always great to have my next guest on the line. Doing an outstanding job covering Monday Night Football for us with my man Joe Tessitore. He is the voice of commentary in the in the booth. The one and only Booger McFarlane is on the line with yours truly. What's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Steve? I don't know how the hell you can be good. You love football. You love football more than me, Booger McFarlane. I mean, damn. All of these quarterbacks going down. We got we, we got Sam Donald for Monday Night Football tonight. He's down with mononucleosis. We know that's how serious that is. We wish him nothing but a speedy recovery. Uh, Drew Brees going to be out for the next six weeks after his hand injury, courtesy of, of banging it against uh, Aaron Donald's hand. We've got Big Ben Roethlisberger. News just came down about two hours ago. He's out for the season. With an elbow injury, he didn't even suffer from through contact. What the hell is going on, Booger? Man, it's it's uh, it's survival, Stephen A. It's football, man. I mean, injuries are part of the game, and every year it happens. Every single year, I think you can go back and you can find a significant injury. Uh, I think we're going to pay a lot of attention to it now because it's at the quarterback position. And I think all the teams you mentioned, you know, Pittsburgh is going to have a hard time surviving without Big Ben. Uh, no disrespect to Mason Rudolph, but he is not Big Ben Roethlisberger. Um, Drew Brees will be back. And I think, you know, the Saints made Teddy Bridgewater the highest paid backup in the league for a reason. They feel very confident and comfortable in him uh, filling in for Drew, Drew Brees. And, and I think that uh, if he can just kind of keep the ship afloat, he doesn't have to win every game, but, you know, two and four, three and three, if he's going to be out six weeks, when Drew Brees comes back because of the division they play in in the NFC South, uh, Jameis hasn't played good at best. He's been kind of, you know, up and down. Cam Newton res- doesn't resemble anything of the Cam Newton that we're used to seeing. And, and, and I think overall, Matt Ryan um, hasn't been consistent enough. I think when you put all that together, the Saints, although they're going to lose some games, I think they will be fine in the end, assuming that Drew Brees comes back healthy. Do you believe, in my opinion, I think that Drew Brees' injury cost them a Super Bowl berth. I had them coming out of the NFC, but it was because I thought they would have home field advantage. The road to the Super Bowl would have to go through the Mercedes-Benz Dome. And unlike last year where that no that pass interference call that wasn't ultimately cost them, I don't believe that would happen this year. But with this injury going down, I think they'll lose a, a sheer amount of games that they normally would not have lost. As a result, even if they make a playoff push, I don't think they'll have home field advantage, and I think ultimately that will cost them a Super Bowl berth. Well, how do you feel about that uh, analogy right there? Well, I, I disagree with you just because, yes, they are a different team in that dome, but I, I'll take my chances with Sean Payton and Drew Brees, uh, healthy, clicking all cylinders, regardless of what stadium or what field we're going to play on. And, and I think that if you're Sean Payton, that's the message that you got to convey to your team. Hey, guys. Yeah, we're down, but we're not out. Let's just everybody's got to pick up uh, their particular role one more notch because we got to pick up Drew Brees and Slack because he's not here. And I think Taylor Bridgewater, this is a great opportunity. You know, he had an oppor- he had a chance to go find a starting job this offseason. He decided to come back to New Orleans, be under Sean Payton because Sean could help him mature and further his career as a quarterback. Now he gets an opportunity for an extended period of time to do that. And so I, I think Teddy's going to be fine. It's tough yesterday. So I, I don't want people to look at yesterday and say, well, Teddy can't do it. It's one thing to be the backup when you get 15% of the reps and then you got to go in and play the entire game. 
Teddy Bridgewater is going to have an entire week of practice, study. They're going to tailor the game plan toward him. And I think he's going to be miles better next week than he was this past Sunday coming in in a backup role. We're going to follow right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. I I, I think it's safe to say with Big Big Ben Roethlisberger finished for the season courtesy of his elbow injury. Combined with the way the Steelers have looked the first two games of the season, albeit with – uh, against uh, New, New England and Seattle uh, with the way the Baltimore Ravens are looking right now. I I think the Steelers fin- season is finished. Where are you at as it pertains to looking at these Pittsburgh Steelers based on what you've seen from them over these first two weeks? Well, I think Pittsburgh was always going to be a team that's going to have to outscore you because their defense still just hasn't quite gotten together, especially on the back end. You know, Tom Brady, Torched them week one. Russell Wilson hit their defense up for 300 yesterday, uh, giving up big plays in the past game. They gave up what a, like a first and 30. He got a pass interference call uh, yesterday. So their defense has been shaky. So they were going to always have to outscore you. Now that becomes a lot more difficult to do without Big Ben. Mason Rudolph plays Oklahoma State. We know he can throw the football. He's been doing it for a long time. Uh, but he's just got to get up to speed with the, the different coverages and defenses that he's going to get. Uh, Juju's going to have to step up. James Conner's got to step up. Everybody's got to do a little bit more when the backup quarterback is in there. So uh, it was always going to be an offensive team until late in the season. Now I think they're going to struggle because I don't know if they can score enough points because their defense isn't the same steel curtain uh, of old where they were just dominant top one, two, three in the league. Uh, They are giving up a lot of passing yards, and I think that's going to be ultimately their downfall. Booker McFarlane. Tonight is Monday Night Football. The New York Jets won't have Sam Donald. Um, I know you had some expectations for them this season, particularly on the defensive side of the ball, but now they've been called upon to step up even more after losing their opener to the Buffalo Bills. Um, It's hard for me to imagine that the Jets are going to be impressive at all. Trevor Simeon is a pro quarterback. I'll give him that. But he's no Sam Donald. There is no number one receiver with uh, with Crowder or Anderson there. Um, and and it, I don't know what to expect from Le'Veon Bell, at least at this particular point. Where's your mindset about the Jets going into their Monday night encounter tonight? Obviously, you'll be calling that game when they go up against the Cleveland Browns. Well, I, I think, you know, human nature is to say back up. He's not going to be as good. But, Stephen, after watching the tape, I can tell you that Sam Donald didn't play well last week. And, and I feel very comfortable saying that Trevor Simeon, will at least play as good as Sam Donald played last week. And more than likely, he's going to play a lot better. So that's going to give your offense a boost. Le'Veon Bell is still as good as advertised. He is still one of the top five three-down running backs in the National Football League. And you couple that with Adam Gase's ability to scheme plays open for Demarius Thomas or Jamison Crowder, I think you can see a path where they can move the football. Now, it's going to be paramount on the other side of the ball that their defense, minus C.J. Mosley, minus Quentin Williams, the third overall pick out of Alabama, how are they going to slow down the Browns' offense, who is, oh, by the way, coming in with a point to prove because they, they fell flat on their face last week. So I think the Jets' offense is going to be what they are. They'll move the ball. Le'Veon will make his plays. Uh, Simeon is not going to wet the bed because he's got plenty of starts in his career. So, like, the offense will be fine. I'm just concerned how do they stop Jarvis and Odell and Joku and Chubb and Baker Mayfield, especially – how they're going to play with a chip on their shoulders because they were disappointed in how they played last week. What are your thoughts about the Cleveland Browns with Odell Beckham Jr. returning uh, to MetLife Stadium? I mean, what are your thoughts about all of that right now as you look forward to this encounter? I think it's a great storyline. You know, he's coming back to New York, uh, the house that he built, you know, so to speak. Uh, It's going to be fun. I'm sure the crowd's going to let him have it. Uh, He's going to be amped up. He's going to have a lot of energy. I think it's just one of the storylines. It's just like the watch. Everybody's making a big deal out of the watch, and I always tell them, I don't care what you wear. As long as the NFL says it's within the rules, you can wear what you want to wear. Uh, Odell is what what you call, and I've heard you say it before, he's box office. So anything that he says or does is going to become a story, and he's got to realize that. And ultimately, when he touches the football tonight, everybody in America is going to think he's going to score. And there are only a few players in this league that feel or, or put that kind of fear in, in defenses, and he's one of them. So he's going to be a huge storyline. I think the fact that this game is in, in New York is only going to heighten that. So I look for Odell and Jarvis to have a big night tonight. Booker McFarlane right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Booker, tell me what's on your mind when we talk about the Cleveland Browns. Um, I'm of that mindset that I think that they – 
I, I don't want to sit up there and say they've been crowned per se, but the level of expectations associated with them. Now, obviously, all of these guys weren't on the team. We get that. But this is a franchise that has not been to the postseason since 2002, basically. They've been moribund for a vast majority of the last uh, 16, 17 years. Yet, because they acquire Odell Beckham Jr., and you pair him with a Baker Mayfield, I thought people looked at the talent that they had instead of the fact that you got a second-year quarterback and a first-year head coach in a National Football League. I don't think that people looked, oh, no, have they paid enough attention to that. And I think because of that, one could argue they may have been a bit overhyped. Talk to me about your feelings as it pertains to the Cleveland Browns and what you expected, what you walked into this season expecting from them before a game was even played. Well, I, I thought they were going to struggle in some form or fashion because you have to learn how to win. And no matter the, the amount of talent you have, no matter how many pro bowlers, no how many offensive weapons or defensive players you acquire, you have to learn how to do the little things, you know, whether it's understanding how to take the check down and not try to throw the 20 yard route and get an interception. It's the little things that wins uh, football games nowadays. And, and I compare it to this, Stephen A. I can go out and buy to Whole Foods or whatever grocery store that you like and get the best ingredients known to man. But if I don't have the right chef and I don't know how to mix those ingredients together, I can't create the meal that's going to be comparable to those ingredients. And so I think it's up for Freddie Kitchen to teach his team how to win. They have to understand how to do the little things to win football games. Everybody has talent in this league. And so when I looked at Cleveland, I think they're going to be better the second half of the season than the first. And was I surprised they lost to Tennessee? Sure. Was I surprised the fact that they committed 18 penalties more? Yes, that was to me because that to me tells uh, tells me that they're an undisciplined young football team because personal fouls are selfish penalties. Uh, kicking a guy in the neck, that's a selfish penalty. That's basically saying whatever my prerogative is at that moment supersedes what the, what the team goal is. And I think those things have to be coached out throughout the week. And we'll see if they coach them throughout the week, and we'll see what happens tonight. But and Cleveland has talent, but they're just going to have to learn how to do the small things in order for that talent to show on the biggest stage. In a crazy kind of way, the thing that most disappointed me about the Cleveland Browns was Jarvis Landry with the media afterwards where he was getting upset for somebody asked, don't even ask me this question. The guy asked him, it was a perfectly logical uh, question. He was asking, do you believe the lack of activity on the part of some during the preseason hurt y'all in this game? There were plenty of opportunity. There were plenty of times where people had alluded to the Baker Mayfields of the world, Odell Beckham Jr. and others not participating in preseason action nearly as much as they should. And I thought that the, for the most part, these guys were treated like veterans as opposed to young thoroughbreds who had something to prove. Did you have that feeling at all coming into the season about the Browns? No, I, no, I, I didn't have that feeling because the preseason now has become a mockery. Nobody wants to get anyone hurt. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not real football, which is why they're having conversations about doing away with it. That's for an entirely different conversation. What I'll say is that Jarvis's comments were very indicative of what I spoke about earlier. It's a young guy who's super talented. He's frustrated, and they lost in all the expectations. And now I got to deal with the social media. Everybody's saying that we're overrated. I got to deal with all my friends saying, man, what happened to y'all? Like all the things that go into losing a football game are what young players have to deal with. And fans don't think about that. Fans just think about, man, we lost and, you know, we, we move on. But these players have to live their lives from the game, from the time the game ends until the next game and all the little things that nobody ever thinks about that comes with it. So that was indicative of a young player that was frustrated. Jarvis is a stand-up guy. Uh, he is the anti-diva. I definitely, I definitely worker. agree with that. I definitely agree with right. that, which is why I was taken aback that he would Correct. handle post-game media s situations like that. Yeah, that was a little surprise. I, I think in a private moment, he probably uh, regrets that. So, I mean, hopefully he learns from it and moves on. Uh, I think it was a learning experience for Freddie Kitchens also because, you know, Freddie hasn't coached an entire season yet. And so now everybody's going to start, okay, you got the job because of the offensive prowess and because of Baker's development, and you come out in game one and the offense has one good drive and then we don't see anything. And so I think there's a lot of pressure on them to come out tonight and put on the show. So it wouldn't surprise me tonight if in the first four or five plays they try to get one deep to Odell 
or they try to get something to Jarvis because they want to get the momentum. They're a young team. They want to play in rhythm and timing. If the Jets are going to win this game, it's very similar. I'm, I'm going to go in your wheelhouse now. When you play the Golden State Warriors, you got to make the game choppy. Don't let them get in them one of those 16 to nothing runs. You got to make the game a half court game. Well, in football, how do you do that? You run the football, you get first downs, you keep the clock moving, and you keep Baker and Odell and Jarvis on the sideline. That's got to be the Jets' formula tonight if they want to win. Look at McFarlane right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News, the voice of Monday Night Football, right here with us. Right, yours truly, right here with the Stephen A. Smith Show. Booger, what's been the biggest surprise for you thus far in the first two weeks of this NFL season? San Francisco 49ers. Explain. Because Jimmy G had that had that performance on Monday Night Football against the Broncos. Everybody's man, I can't believe he gave Jimmy G all this money, and Jimmy G is not worth it. And all the 49ers have done is go on the road to Tampa, win, go on the road to Cincinnati, and win. And Jimmy G is looking more comfortable. They can run the football defensively. D. Ford, Nick Bosa, Quan Alexander. Do I need to keep going? Richard Sherman. Mm-hmm. Like they got players that can play now, and I think they were my dark horse to kind of come out of nowhere before the season. So uh, they're not a surprise to me. But I think throughout the country, the fact that the Forty ers are two and zero, and also giving shout out to the Buffalo Bills because they're stuck up and way up there by Canada and New York. Nobody talks about them. But they're two and zero also. So I, I think the Forty ers and the well, Bills they beat the Jets and a giant surprise. booger. <laughs> they beat the Jets and the Giants, Booger. Come on now. It's pro football, Stephen. Uh, oh, really? You know uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I, I, I got proof. I got proof for you that it ain't necessarily pro football. You want to hear my proof? Yes, let me hear it. The Miami Dolphins. Is that a professional football team to you? That might be the worst football team in NBA and NFL history right now. You understand that, right? Y- yes, by name only, they are professional football right now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, what an atrocity that has taken place before our very eyes. I ain't blaming Brian Flores. He just got there, and obviously, they, they you know, people are accusing him of tanking or whatever. But, but Booker, I think I can make a legitimate argument. And I ask you, and I'll lean on your expertise. You covered college football for years. You're covering the NFL for us now. You know your football. You're former player in the NFL, obviously, as well as college. Booker, have you ever seen a worse NFL team than you're watching right now in Miami? Ever. No, I, I, no, I haven't, and um, they can say what they want to say. I think I agree with you. The front office is, is is putting Brian Flores and his team in a bad situation. I kind of feel bad for B. Flo too, Stephen yeah. A. Because regardless of what we know, the front office doing is doing. This is going to be on his resume. Yeah. And as an African American coach, who uh, we haven't gotten a lot of opportunities per se when you look at the big picture, and now Brian Flores has one. And the Dolphins might win two games this year, mm. so that two and fourteen is going to be on his record. Regardless, in three or four years, when you look back, nobody's going to remember. Well, the front office put him in a bad situation. All they're going to say is Brian Flores two and fourteen. He's got to live with that. So two and fourteen. You and I both know what they're doing. Two and fourteen. It, it, two and fourteen. Yeah, well, Booker, Booker, I'm making a legitimate I'm argument. Give two, I, I gotta tell you something. I think they might go zero and sixteen, bro. I can't see this team winning the game. I'll be stunned. I'll be stunned. And I, I want to see the NFL team that loses to these Miami Dolphins. I've never seen such an atrocity on an NFL fan. And I'll make the point with this, Booger. It's one thing for you to be bad in November, December. You're 0-9 or 10 or whatever, and you just want to go home, and you're done. I mean, damn, they opened up the season sticking up the joint. They've been stinks since day one. Yeah, uh, it's, it's hard to go 0-16. I, I would venture to say. I don't think it's going to be hard for these guys. Yeah, well, I, I hopefully for B Flow that they luck up and the ball bounce their way at some point throughout the season. I don't think they're going to win more than one or two, but uh, I, I do think they'll get one or two. Booger McFarlane right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News, the eternal optimist, Booger McFarlane. That's what I'm going to call <laughs> it from now on, as long as he's taking this position about the Miami Dolphins. I, I, right now, I have my MVP candidates based on their performances in this order. Patrick Mahomes at number one. Lamar Jackson at number two. Dak Prescott at number three. Any disagreement there for you? Um, I would put Dak two over Lamar because I think that really? the Cowboys are. Yes, I, I think the Cowboys are a better team. Than they Baltimore. played the Giants. They play the Giants, yeah. Booger. Yeah, listen, I'm I'm just going off of the performance. The team on the other side doesn't really matter. I'm looking at the execution. 
I see why you have Pat Mahomes number one, and that's understandable. Speaks for itself. Uh, the Cowboys are a legitimate Super Bowl contender. Dak Prescott right now is driving the price up uh, for Jerry Jones. I really don't understand why Jerry hasn't paid the man. To me, is disrespectful. Yes. To me, the fact that Jerry doesn't go ahead and take I care. I would venture to say, and, and take care. Of him. I, I would venture to say that none of the other quarterbacks, none of the other headline quarterbacks, will be treated this way. I like. I, I couldn't see a. I, I couldn't paint a picture where you have a young quarterback that's playing well, who's basically playing on the, on, a, on, on, the, on the last 14 games of his deal, mm-hmm. who's not been taken care of. Because what it does is give Dak peace of mind. You can talk about the insurance policy and all the stuff he's got endorsement, mm-hmm. but that's not his contract. That's and true. right now, he doesn't have peace of mind. So the fact that Jerry is still playing little mental gymnastics with his quarterback, I completely disagree with I will tell you this, too. You probably I, I stand corrected because I said he played the Giants, completely forgetting that Lamar Jackson played the Miami Dolphins in week one. Shame <laughs> on me. Shame on me, Booger McFarlane. And you're absolutely right about that peace of mind. For people out there that don't realize, that stuff matters. When you're wondering about your contract status, wondering whether or not you're going to get paid, it makes you look at other people salty. Like, really, really you really hesitating to pay me? So I kind of wonder... What Dak Prescott, he doesn't give me any impression that he's going to let it fluster him, nor does he give me any impression that he's going to allow his professionalism to dissipate in any way. But I don't blame him, you know, for if he's a bit frustrated. Make no mistake about it. Last question, Antonio Brown with the, with the Patriots yesterday. It's hard for me to take anything he's done seriously because they were, they were against the Dolphins. The flip side is that <laughs> realizing what he can do not just as a wideout, but in the slot as well, um, it, it, it's something special that could be brewing in New England. And I'm just hoping that they're not the Golden State Warriors with Kevin Durant of the NFL where we're looking at them and knowing nobody can beat them. That's what I'm hoping for, Booger. What about you? Well, um, you know, football is, has a way of, of, of humbling and even taking the most talented teams and, and putting them – um, in defeat. You know, we've seen what happened to the Philadelphia Eagles when they thought they had a dream team. Now, I realize Tom Brady is the GOAT, and this is an entirely different animal. If Antonio Brown uh, can keep his nose clean, come in and work hard, their offense is going to be as unstoppable, if not more, than the Kansas City Chiefs. And I would favor New England because New England's defense is better. And, and, and I think those two teams if they stay healthy or on a collision course for another AFC championship game, and it doesn't matter where you play it at, like that game is going to be one for the ages. Um, I just hope AB gives us something positive to talk about. I'm tired of talking about AB in a negative light because he, he's one of the young dynamic players in football. Uh, a lot of kids look up to him. And for whatever reason, he just doesn't understand the platform he's on. But oftentimes in life, you don't start to realize that until – it's too late, and I hope he doesn't realize it, you know, five, ten years down the road, the opportunity in the platform that he has now. Look at me, Father. Looking forward to listening to you tonight. Call the Jets, Browns, Monday Night Football, buddy. I'll be watching. Thanks so much, my man. Thanks, Stephen. I appreciate it, buddy. All right. The one and only Booker McFarlane right here with Stephen A. ESPN Radio, ESPN News, 888-SAY-ESPN. As always, the number to call up is 888-729-3776. We'll get to your phone calls and more right after this break. You are listening live, so don't touch that dial. It is the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. By the way, when it comes to hiring, you don't have time to waste. You need to get to your short list of qualified candidates fast. That's why you need Indeed.com. Post a job in minutes, set up screening questions based on your job requirements, then zero in on qualified candidates using an intuitive online dashboard. Discover why more than 3 million businesses use Indeed for hiring. Post a job today at Indeed.com slash hire. That's Indeed.com.